Welcome everybody. I'm Professor Jay Bhattacharya. I'm a professor of medicine at Stanford University and I'm conversing today with Professor John Ioannidis, my good friend, uh, also a professor at medicine at Stanford University. John, thank you for the, uh, making the time to talk. Uh, I have put together a list of questions and um, uh, I figured what we do is I just bring a question up, you start, we'll have a little conversation. There's 10 questions and so... Sounds wonderful. We, we can make them 100. Okay. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll go. We'll we'll, uh, yep. we'll have to have ten of these. Then. <laughs> okay, so so John, um, I, I want to start by talking about uh, about how deadly COVID actually is, and uh, and why is it so strangely difficult to get an answer to that, and why has it been so controversial? Uh, you know, obviously, you know, because we worked together on this. That, uh, we worked on the Santa Clara seroprevalence study, which measured antibodies in the population of Santa Clara County. Uh, in April, early April of 2020, and we found 2.8% of the population in Santa Clara County very early in the, in the pandemic had antibodies. That led us to an infection fatality rate. Infection fatality rate, the number of people that had died up to that time, divided by the, the number of people in the county we thought had COVID based on the antibodies, about 0.2%, 99.8% mm -hmm. survival, right? Um, so, so tell us, can you tell me your view of that study and then your view of the literature, how it's evolved you know, since then in terms of what the infection fatality rate actually is for COVID? Well, Jay, as, as you know, that was an early study and uh, people were struggling to understand uh, in what ballpark are we playing. And uh, uh, there were very widely discrepant views. Uh, some people uh, proposing estimates of infection fatality rate that were based on what we were observing, uh, which were just uh, the people who we had documented infection. And based on what we know now, these were just a very tiny minority, especially with the little testing that we were doing back then. And others who were far more optimistic and they were thinking that, uh, well, there's a whole iceberg uh, that we need to reveal and we just see the tip of the iceberg. So it, it was a study that at the time that it happened, uh, it could be very informative and I think it was informative. Since then, we have about 3,000 seroprevalence estimates in different settings, in different locations, in different situations, in different populations, uh, in different mix-up of uh, people who are infected. And uh, one cannot give a single answer because uh, this virus has a tremendous gradient of risk. I think that this is probably the, the strongest risk gradient that I have seen in my career as an epidemiologist. Uh, throughout my life, I was happy when I was discovering gene variants that would increase your risk by 1.02 fold. And now we have something that has a risk gradient across young versus very elderly and debilitated of 10,000 fold. Uh, so this is, this is very unique. And that also means that the infection fatality rate depends tremendously on what is the case mix. What kind of setting, what kind of population is infected and what kind of population we are protecting not to be infected. So the old, very, very high risk if, from the bad If you outcomes. have an outbreak in kindergarten, your infection fatality rate is going to be 0, 0.00. I mean, you start adding zeros. Some kids will die, unfortunately, and every single death, regardless of age, is a tragedy, but you really need to add a lot of zeros and then some digit. If you go to a, a frail population in a nursing home with lots of comorbidities, it could be 25%. One out of four people who are infected will die. Now, a real world population has some kindergarten and some nursing homes, some young, some middle-aged, some elderly, some people with uh, frailty, some people with comorbidities, some people with many comorbidities. So, so your, your eventual number is not really just up to the virus. It is up to what you do to avoid the virus really hitting you hard and being able to protect those who need to be protected. Ideally, I would not want to have anyone being infected, but we are in a situation where probably we have six, 360 million documented cases, but probably we have like 5 billion <laughs> infections that have happened. And, and we see that we still have very active epidemic waves. So, so people do get infected. I wish we could have fewer people infected, but the big issue is how to avoid having those who would be a massacre if they get infected. So that, that's question two, John. Ah, goodness. On I, precision I, shielding. I, so you're, you're, you're run jumping very ahead. very fast. <laughs> no, so let me, let me, but no, actually, because so, so before we get on the question, I had a couple of 
thoughts about and questions about uh, your experience in writing about the infection fatality rate. That, and um, in, in particular, I've seen, you know, obviously you've written some very interesting summaries of those 3,000 plus uh, estimates. And the estimates you get are much closer to 0 0.2, 0 0.15, something. I mean, I don't know what your favorite number is for the overall. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and you're absolutely right. The gradient is so steep, especially by age, by institutional settings, so nursing homes are worse. It's, there's not one single number, right? You have this enormous, in, in, enormous variation. And, I, and um, what we've seen, I've seen in the literature, though, is that there's everyone focuses on the single number, right? right? And so you have uh, comp your, your analyses where you, you publish a rate, something like 0.2 for the whole world, 0.15 for the whole world. Um, and yet, and there are also competing analyses that find much higher numbers, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, higher, higher numbers. Why is there that discrepancy in the literature? Is that common in these kinds of literatures to find such a discrepancy? Is it simply just because of a different case mix that they're considering? I, I think that it is not uncommon. And uh, the, the reason for that is that you need to make a lot of decisions about which studies are eligible to be included in the calculations and also what exact numbers go to uh, the calculation of, uh, of that uh, fraction. You know, so, so you need to, to estimate uh, how many people are infected and then also how many people died. Uh, so it, it may sound a bit weird, but even for how many people died, even though death is the most obvious outcome, there can be some uncertainty about how exactly you should measure that. For example, how much time you should leave for people from the time that they're infected until you start counting and, and you stop counting deaths as being related to that infection, um, whether we have been able to capture deaths reliably. You wrote a paper reliably. about that, right? So. Indeed, I, I wrote a paper trying to take a step back and think of classic epidemiological theory with some improvements, trying to think whether we underestimate or overestimate COVID-19 related deaths. And the, the answer is that in some settings we underestimate them and in some other settings we overestimate them. In the same country, probably we may overestimate and underestimate in different time periods. For example, in, in the US, probably we underestimated deaths in the very early months of the pandemic because we were doing very li limited testing. I think currently probably we are overestimating deaths because we do tremendous amount of testing. And I mean, if you just wait for labeling uh, of uh, you have a positive test and then you die, Lots of people die with a positive test. And, and it, across the world, the, that picture and that relative balance of over and underestimation is, is very different. So th there's, there's lots of decisions that need to be made in these calculations. And uh, if you choose different studies, if you choose different interpretations of these studies, if you choose different reading of the numbers, you can get results that are not the same. Now, even those studies that disagree, I think, if you look very carefully, they don't disagree that much. So maybe there's like a two-fold difference, but it's nothing compared to the tenfold difference or more that these estimates have compared to the early expectations. And I, I think that um, I, I, it's completely open to look at the numbers and have some diversity of how exactly they should be read, but probably the estimates that I gave both in the bulletin of the WHO paper and the AJCI paper and then some subsequent work that I did with uh, Catherine Axworth, I think that they're probably within the range that other people have observed as well. Yeah, so, so um, the facts I, t I take away, I think they're completely uncontroversial, is what you said about the, the risk gradient, the, 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 the incredible dependency of the fatality rate by age. So let's, let's, go, let's move on to question two. Um, what do we do with that fact? Because that seems extraordinary. And you, you actually alluded to this. Like you've, in, in epidemiology, you're looking for things with a, a large risk gradient because they can use that to do, for instance, uh, personalized medicine depends on that, right? If I have uh, factors that I find in you that, are, that, that, that have very steep, age, uh, steep gradients, then I can, I can tailor my therapy for the the set of factors you particularly have that I wouldn't give to somebody else, right? That's the, that's the philosophy of personalized medicine. Um, so what would you, what we do with that fact epidemiologically, this age gradient? I have, I have some, some Be, ideas. Before, before the pandemic uh, came along, uh, we, we had a lot of enthusiasm about precision medicine or personalized medicine or individualized medicine. And what is the premise of that? The premise is that 
we want interventions to be tailored to the individual. Every person is different, every per person has different risks, has a different background, has different circumstances, has different genetics, has different comorbidities, uh, different risk factors, uh, different lifestyle. And we want to use that information to be able to tailor the best management, the best prevention, the best treatment, depending on what arises for each individual. Now, this precision medicine approach had a lot of followers and I would say that it was mainstream. It was like a bandwagon term. Everybody wanted to switch from average medicine, which means that everybody will be treated in the same way and everybody will get the same preventive approach and uh, you're not going to get anything special. So you want to tailor the, the treatment to this particular uh, characteristics of the person you're treating. You treat each exactly. person as a person. Exactly. Right? So, so, so it, it was very attractive and, and lots of work was focused on trying to achieve that. I have to say that we had modest successes. Uh, some of the uh, disciplines of science that absorbed the largest amount of, uh, of funding, like uh, genetics for example, uh, genetics and genomics. Why did we have all of that uh, money going to genomics? Because supposedly it would lead us to precision medicine, to individualized medicine, to personalized medicine. It did to some extent, but not to the point that we wanted, because as I said, most of these risk factors that we were discovering were risk factors of 1.02 fold difference in risk at a time. So even if you get a hundred of them, which we could, maybe you get two-fold difference or three-fold difference, but no better than that. So here, with COVID-19, suddenly we, we come across situations where we really see that people are extremely difficult or different. So, so I just want to take back to the timing of this, because I think the timing is really important. When did we know that there was this enormous age gradient in risk? Very, very early. Uh, I think that we were suspecting it from probably the very first days when we started seeing some of the fatalities kind of concentrated in people who were older and debilitated. I uh, remember the Chinese uh, data came out I yeah. in a, in a, and it was so stark. No, no kids had died in their data sets and uh, in enormous numbers of older people. I, I, I think that we had a sense that that was the case maybe in February uh, or so, c clearly by March. And the, the question is what exactly is the steepness of, of that risk and uh, are there any peculiarities uh, can we make it more granular because it's not just uh, age, it's also comorbidities. What are the exact effects of comorbidities like obesity, for example, or uh, having uh, smoked in the past and having... So, I mean, I remember in the early days, asthma was seen as a big risk, but probably less than so now. It kind of fell into yeah. a lower uh, risk uh, but, profile. Okay, but age, age has stayed. That was, that was identified early. What, what, uh, now, you wrote a paper about, you called it precision shielding. So mm -hmm. can, you, can you describe that idea? So, so that paper was an effort, again, to use epidemiology and extend it to that particular problem and try to estimate how are we doing in terms of protecting people who are at high risk versus people who are at low risk. And you could use different types of contrasts on who is the so, lowest so just, and just high so, risk. Just so everyone understands. So what you mean is um, we, uh, one country says, let's try to protect everybody equally. Mm -hmm. Another country says... Let's try to f focus our protection on the old. This is kind of like the Great Barrington Declaration idea, focus protection. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the question is, which country does better in terms of protecting its population from death, right? Is that, that the... That, that's the equivalent at the policy level. But, but of course, as you understand, it's one thing what you want to do as policy, and it's another thing what actually happens. Yes, because, of course. You know, as, as policy, uh, I could say, I want to save the world, and uh, no one will die. Uh, and uh, who says that? No, oh, Johnny uh, yes, and, <laughs> and then millions die. And uh, I tried, but my policy did not work. So, so it's an issue both of practicality and whether the policy can really be translated to the real world. Okay, so let's, let's hold off on the policy. Let's just describe the precision shielding idea. So, so here's, here's the concept. You have populations who can be broken down to groups of high risk and low risk. And you can look at whatever contrast you want. So an easy contrast is to look at elderly versus non-elderly, and you can set some threshold, let's say 65 years old or 70 or 60. You can do it whichever way you want. Or, and, you can look at people who are in nursing home uh, and long-term care facilities versus others who are community dwelling and uh, uh, then compare these two groups. So if you measure the infection rates, 
the seroprevalence, for example, how many people have antibodies, which are an indicator that they have been exposed in the past, you can see uh, how many people, what is the proportion of people who have been infected in the high-risk group, whichever way you define it, and the low-risk group. Right. And ideally, policy would aim to protecting the high-risk group because that's where you get the worst Primarily, right. yes. I mean, ideally, as I said, I, I, I want no one to be infected. <laughs> yes, of course. But, but, but the reality is that, as I said, right now we have, who knows, maybe 5 billion infections. So, so infections do happen. And for a highly infectious virus uh, like this one, it, it's practically impossible to completely, completely avoid it. So if you have infections... Actually, let's hold that thought. Okay. Is, we'll, we'll, is, zero, is zero COVID <clears throat> possible? Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupt you. No, oh, we'll, we'll come back to that. In we'll a come to back yeah. to that because zero depends. Is it zero? Is it uh, one? Is it two? Is it a million? Okay. <laughs> I mean, we have to decide what is zero. Uh, but I'm, I'm coming back to the precision shielding idea. So you can look at the data from seroprevalence studies and, and see what is the percentage of the high risk versus the percentage of the low risk. And other things being equal, you want a lower percentage in the high-risk population. So you want a lower percentage in nursing homes. You want a lower percentage in long-term care, care facilities. You want a lower percentage in elderly people. Because if you let these people infected, then you get a massacre. Unfortunately, what happened in real life, and we saw that, in countries that had very stringent lockdown policies, we saw the exact opposite. Th this happened practically in every European country, more or less, with, with few exceptions that had stringent lockdowns and still had a lot of deaths in, in the first wave, we had massive deaths in nursing homes. A few countries managed to avoid this, but not that many. We saw the same in the US. We, we saw massive deaths in nursing homes. When we go back and we do seroprevalence studies in populations in long-term care facilities, we see that their infection rates were multiple times higher compared to the general population. Mm. In, in some cases, you had infection rates of 2%, it's 5%. Ne negative shielding then. Yeah, uh, in the general population. And you had like 50% <laughs> infection rate in nursing homes. So, so this is inverse protection. In, in a way, we let the virus go and hit those places and those populations who we should have protected much better. I mean, the idea of lockdown was to, to slow down community spread and thereby protect the vulnerable, right? That was the, that was the theory. And you still hear it today, right? Why? Yeah. You're, it, you're letting it, the virus it was a risk. misplaced theory because, uh, of course, when you have an active epidemic wave, you need to do things to try to limit your exposures. So I, I would not argue that if you have an active epidemic wave, you should have mass gatherings, you know, more than you had before and just have everyone maximally exposed to, to get infected. I mean, it, it just doesn't parties. make sense. You, know, you, you have to make a very strong message. We have a problem. It's a deadly virus out there. Uh, we need to protect ourselves and protect others. Try to minimize your exposures. You can still carry on with essential things about your life and, and keeping your mental health intact and keeping your schools uh, and your kids at, at, at school. But, you know, that's not probably an opportunity to, to do wild things with, with very heavy exposures. But the, the way that lockdowns were applied they did nothing practically in most countries to protect those who had to be protected. If anything, they made these people more susceptible because nursing homes and long-term care facilities, they were not protected. We had very limited testing. We had staff that were moving from one nursing home to another in many countries like Sweden and, and many other places. So the, people the got States too. massively infected. Same yeah. thing happened in the States in many facilities. Th these people were abandoned. We didn't, didn't have just COVID-19. There was panic. There was fear. They were led to die from thirst and hunger in many cases. It's we, in Quebec, I know I, I heard that. Yeah. We have a very nice review by uh, Kyle Hennigan on, on this topic, you know, looking at, at the ripple effects of, of what really happened in long-term care, care yeah. facilities. We, we had excess deaths that, that were far more than just the, the COVID infection, which, which was a tremendous There's also there's problem. evidence of deaths from loneliness at these facilities. Uh, of course, of course. Yeah. So, so, so in a way, the lockdown and the panic that it instilled did exactly the opposite. It, it just led these people to their fate. It, it actually accelerated their fate. It did their best to kill them, in, in a way. Yeah. Uh, and, and then for, for the elderly who were in the general population and those who were vulnerable, I think I, we did very little. Because the lockdown protected people who were mostly more healthy than the average person. It protected people like, like me, uh, who, you know, 
could do we all my work. We sometimes, so. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not very well. But not very well. Yeah, we can probably practice better <laughs> on that. But, but I could do all my work practically with Zoom, and I could teach and lecture uh, and, uh, and do everything. Well, other people who were in much worse health than me, who had less health coverage or no health coverage, were out there in the street as essential workers fighting with a pandemic for me to survive, who, who had no need to be protected practically. No. I mean, essentially, we, we uh, I like to use the term laptop class. We protected the set of yeah. people who could work from home from their laptop or, or, or desktop computer without losing their work. And the, the essential worker class, whether they were old or, or vulnerable, they were asked to go work exactly. and be exposed to the virus. Exactly. And, and, and these people are the majority. Uh, of course, probably they're not the majority in, in my community, uh, which is mostly professionals. There's a nationwide professionals. estimate, actually, an economist did. Right, in the United States, about 30% of workers like this. Okay. That but, could, but, where you could replace the work. But if you look at a global perspective, I think that, that they're yeah. clearly the majority. In fact, there was a, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in, there was a study, a seroprevalence study done in Mumbai in uh, summer of 2020 that found that uh, in uh, the slums of Mumbai, the seroprevalence was something like 60-70%. And in the rest of Mumbai, it was 20%. Right, yeah. Right? Precision shielding of the rich. At, at a global level, lockdowns uh, made things worse. Be, because we, we thought of a very ideal situation where humans are like pawns or, or little robots that we turn off the switch yeah. and we place them in a room. And they stay there for three weeks, three months, three years, I don't know, 30 years, please no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then this is it. Uh, and and that, that has... Nothing to do with reality. I mean, I can't believe that someone who has some common sense and some minimal knowledge of public health would have proposed this. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. So, so, the, so, I mean, now you made a case then that the lockdowns, them, in terms of what they were aiming to do, which is to protect the population from COVID, failed to protect those who are most vulnerable. Indeed. What about the other effects of lockdowns? I think you already alluded to some of them, right? The, like the... the, the psychological harm from having to be apart from each other is, is actually that's a it's, real thing. It's, it's horrible because a pandemic, especially a, p a pandemic as deadly as COVID-19, is, is a major challenge for all of us. It's a major challenge for our communities, for, 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 for humans as, as societies, as you know, human beings. It's, it's like the extreme stress that you can get. So, so people who were stressed, th there's no one to blame for, for that because it, it is anticipated that you will be maximally stressed. It is a little bit like running a marathon. And it's not a marathon that a single person is running. It, it is a whole cohort of people who are running that marathon. And, and what we want to, to get is to have everyone finish that marathon uh, with as good timing as possible. I mean, some people are slower and some people are faster, but we want everybody to be able to, to get to the end and still be alive. So... The, the lockdown philosophy and restrictive measures and aggressive measures and, and c continuous bombardment by, by media and social media and everything that, that uh, there's irresponsible people and uh, uh, we, we need more, we need more aggressive, uh, you're not doing well, if enough. You, and, if you, and if you say the IFR is infection fatality rate is... <laughs> is 0.2 percent well yeah then 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 you you're a horrible person i mean you you want to kill people you you want to because you're telling the truth about what the the death rate is I, i'm sorry i mean the, the, these are the numbers what yeah. what can i say the the numbers are both wonderful and horrible at the same time yeah. it it was good news but at the same time horrible news because if you take the ifr for the vulnerable and the elderly that's that's really yeah. apocalyptic so the question is, how do you move out of there and how do you run that marathon without flogging the runners? Because what we did with lockdown and with aggressive measures, it was as if we, we took that cohort of people and we started flogging them. They had to run 42 kilometers and at you the know, same time we were flogging them. It's actually a literal them. thing. So in, in, uh, in the early days of the lockdown in India, 10 million migrant workers were, were forced to re go back to their home villages. They're working in big cities very poor choice. Hand to mouth, right? So they, they buy the f coconuts for the day. They sell the coconuts with the money. They buy f food for their family and coconuts to sell the next day. Immediately, there's, there's, a, there's a lockdown order. You're not going to sell your coconuts because no one's in the streets. You're gonna, and then the order is to go back home. Home is sometimes a thousand miles away. There's no organized movement. There's just 
a, a disorganized rush to send 10 million people it, it, on, a, on a trail of tears, it's been called, where, where a thousand died overnight. It, it is horrible, and very little of that, or none of that, was in the news. Very little of that was within our, our screens. Uh, I, I mean, we had, as you say, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, disadvantaged people all over the world, who were suffering, who were dying, who were dying from starvation, hunger. from hunger, I mean, you know, from, from, from things that, that, goodness, we should have done something. And at the same time, we're just measuring cases, you know, in, in, in Palo Alto. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's really a shame that we let that happen, that, that we just lost the perspective of what really matters. And I think that probably we have lost lots of people, far more than what we have counted. Not because of the virus itself. The virus was horrible and it was a major problem, but mostly because of what we did and how we responded to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my first guess is that if you take the set of lives saved by lockdown, which I think is, I mean, we'll, we'll have a lot of debate, we'll probably debate that for, for the rest of my life. Um, but w let's just take that as a, whatever, whatever number you want for that. The, the number of people that died from a consequence of the lockdowns themselves, the collateral harm is orders of magnitude more. I, I think that I agree with you. And, and the biggest problem is that we will never reach consensus on this because people have not paid attention on capturing these other dimensions with the, the same level of granularity as we did for COVID-19 per se and infections from COVID-19. And we have an indirect tool through excess deaths. But as you know, excess deaths are extremely difficult to model. Yeah. I, I mean, it depends on what assumptions you make, what is your pre-pandemic period, what time of time, kind of time series you use, what kind of autoregression coefficients you want to correct and then for. And also you can't tell what the source of the excess death was. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so, so let's say that you go through that first mess yes. <laughs> and you get some estimates which are very fragile. And then you have to say, so then what really killed these people? Yeah. Uh, what was the un real underlying cause? And you cannot answer, and I think many people make that mistake, oh, it was the virus. Well, yes, the virus was a major threat, but it was not just the virus. It was the virus plus what we did. Well, I think if you're seeing the deaths in younger populations, at high excess deaths in younger populations, it's very difficult, I think, to attribute that to the virus. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't, there's, there's no way to attribute it to, yeah. to the virus. So, uh, indeed, there, I think you get a much cleaner picture of the impact of what we did. Right. Uh, and it's very sad based on what I have seen so far. It, the, the numbers are not final, and I hope that they're exaggerated because all scientific literature has a tendency to exaggeration in early estimates, but I, I think that it would be lamentable eventually if we take a close look at these numbers. Okay, John, we actually covered question three. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, let's do question four. Uh, question four, was there ever really a consensus in favor of lockdown? Depends on whom you ask. I, I think that... Uh, well, can, I, can I come with thinking <laughs> in setting this question up, right? So uh, it felt in the early days of the pandemic, if you were against the lockdown, that you were alone. At least I felt alone. Mm -hmm. I saw your stat news piece in the early days of the epidemic. I was thinking along the same lines. And in fact, I wrote a piece uh, in the Wall Street Journal with a very similar argument. Um, and it was amazing to find you, John, because I didn't. I, I thought that I was. I had gone crazy. That I was looking at this wrong. Um, what I found since is that there were many scientists who felt the same way, but didn't didn't really. The 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 the, the environment was so oppressive that it was difficult to speak up. You're absolutely right about that, and uh, the the problem is that. We had an official stance in, in different locations and different countries. And we also had media and we also had social media kind of supporting usually whatever that official stance uh, would have been. It was very difficult to have a different narrative. And uh, who determined that stance? I, I still don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a little bit like herd, and I'm not talking about herd immunity, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking herd of, of herd mentality here that once you have, let's say, one politician take a very aggressive stance and say, I'm going for a very aggressive lockdown, then everybody else, every other politician will say, 
Well, if I don't do that, they will tell me but that I didn't do enough. Aren't, aren't scientists supposed to be sort of independent-minded, a little bit, a little bit contrary? Uh, yeah, in my utopian world, maybe. <laughs> but uh, but goodness, we're not. Yeah. We're not. We, we're we're just biased humans. I, I feel that I'm I'm biased all the time. I'm just struggling to understand my biases and hopefully sometimes get rid of of a few of them. It, it's not easy, and it's not easy even less so when you have an environment that is so dominant, so pervasive, and so high-pitched that uh, we know what we need to do, and everybody else is doing it. Who, who, who? Uh, uh, yes, yes, we, we all do that. We, we all say the same thing. So, so it, it, was it a consensus? I don't know. I mean, I, I had the same experience. I, I've heard from hundreds and thousands of scientists who, who felt that that was entirely stupid. Uh, but if you were to ask, uh, so can you say that? No, I cannot say that. Let me be honest. Uh, in the beginning, I thought that lockdown was a good idea. I have to apologize for this, retrospectively. But I put my weight for whatever weight I might have. Maybe none at all. But John and Is, what do you think? In my early interviews in, in several countries, I said, it's a good thing that we do that. Why? Because as I wrote in my stat piece, we have no clue what we're dealing about. So it, that stat piece says it could be up to 40 million deaths within a couple of months. I was talking about within a couple of months. So if it's 40 million deaths within a couple of months, you don't want to risk that. You want to find out about what you're dealing with and then decide. So can, actually, can I, let's, let's explore that for just a second because yeah. I think that's really interesting, right? So I mean, and normally people talk about that, they'll say this is the precautionary principle. Of course, right? yeah. Um, uh, but like in my view of the precautionary principle, uh, you, have, you, have, you still have benefits and costs of an action. Indeed. Yeah. And the precautionary principle says, uh, well, let's assume the worst about the nature of the thing you're trying to prevent. In this case, mm -hmm. the deaths from COVID itself. Let's assume that if we did literally nothing, we'd get millions and millions yeah. of deaths, right? Yeah. That, um, then you have to still compare that against the harms from the policy. And you're not allowed, in the context of the precautionary principle, to assume that the policy has no harms. You can't assume the, simultaneously the yeah. worst about the disease and the best about the policy. You still have to have a sober-minded evaluation of the harms. I, I, I'm on the same wavelength, but I'm a lockdown supporter, Jay, okay? <laughs> I was a lockdown supporter back then because I said, okay, you're telling me 40 million deaths. I do have concerns about harms, to be honest. I had no clue what the harms would be, but the, there, there were concerns, real concerns, about harms and ripple effects on multiple other dimensions. But you're telling me that 40 million deaths are on the table. I cannot really afford that. So, okay, I'm one of you. I agree with the lockdown yeah. for a few weeks until we find out what we're dealing with, right. until we sort out the Hence risks. the seroprevalence studies. The and, yeah. seroprevalence, the infection yeah. fatality rates, the distributions, the, the risk gradients. And, and then we can revisit. It, it may be that we just need to shut down forever. And, you know, that was the last glimpse of humanity on planet Earth. We now all go underground into one room per person. I mean, I don't know, maybe, you know, if, if we had a virus that would kill 8 billion people, maybe yeah. that, that would have been the solution. But within a few weeks, I think the picture became far more clear. That's not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about a serious risk, a risk that is going to be horrible if it is mishandled, if we let the vulnerable and the frail people to be affected, it will be a disaster. But we have a very different picture compared to 40 million deaths within just a couple of weeks or a couple of months and kind of everyone being affected and everyone dying in the streets. Right. So the, That's absolute, not so, what so the we're absolute magnitude matters of the, of the infection fatality rate as well as the gradient. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Both things matter. And, and then all the other considerations about risks and benefits become extremely relevant. Yeah. And, and then you need to decide what to do to minimize the harm, to get that cohort of marathon runners to be able to finish. And you know, based on past pandemics, that this is not going to be two weeks or three weeks or two months. Pandemic lasts two years, three years. The way we have handled that, whether we try to protract things, it may last even longer. Well, I mean, in many ways, we misled the public. We said, oh, two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah. That, well, that, just that another was, couple of months. Another where couple have months. you seen a pandemic that lasted for two weeks? I mean, I mean, you know, for, for a virus of, of that sort. So, so we should have been honest to ourselves to say that we are going for the long term. And the long term 
as we see it now means that this virus is going to be with us probably, who knows, until the end of human species. Okay, so now is, is, not a, now is a good time. <laughs> now is a good time to talk about zero COVID. Okay. <laughs> Was it ever possible? Uh, just, just, just to set it up, people will sometimes point to SARS-1, yeah. which, is, which has disappeared. Uh, no, I don't believe really with concerted human action, but it, it disappeared, right? Well, um, SARS-1 and SARS-2 are very different beasts. Uh, one has an amazingly higher average infection fatality rate compared to the other, which has that, that very peculiar gradient. Uh, it's far more difficult to transmit. It kills people who are infected, really, much yeah. of the time, most of the time, perhaps. And um, that, that's a very different story. So for, for something that is so widespread, it's not really possible so the, to the, do so that. So the high transmissibility made it impossible. Was it po like, let's say we had, sometimes you'll hear zero COVID people lament that we didn't have a sharper lockdown, say in March. Would, would that yeah. have led to zero? So I, I, I'm trying to, to, to think, you know, for, for the argument in favor of this happening. Do we have an example that was very successful? I, I want to give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, Australia, New Zealand, but you know it hit China. There. It hit oh, well. So just take Australia, and New Zealand. Those yeah. are island nations. It hit during their summer, which seems Indeed. to be during so, so COVID low season. Right? Perhaps if you have a situation that you have a very limited burden, a very limited seeding burden, okay, and you really close the door. So Australia is an island, <laughs> and New Zealand is an island. Uh, maybe you can avoid it for some time. But as you see now, I mean. Australia now has huge epidemic waves. China, I, I really don't know exactly what happened in China and what kind of measures they took. I see now that they put people in containers when they uh, need to be quarantined. Um, if we put people in containers, would it have worked in the US? Someone has to put the person in the container. Oh, oh goodness, um, I, I don't want to see this. How about this. newborn babies? <laughs> Do they belong in containers by themselves? I mean. I think I think that kind of policy is not is not humane. I mean, and I don't I, whether it I, works I, I just, or not. I I, not, yeah. I cannot defend that policy by any means. Yeah. And and I, I I really don't know eventually what it means. You know, other than the early ability to contain an epidemic wave. Well, uh, I mean, so, you, you, but, the epidemic wave will come sooner or later. I mean, and and for these viruses, I mean, influenza has been for us for for thousands of years and comes back again and again, and each year is a different year, and, and one year is going to be 1918. It's not smallpox. It's, it's not the same. It, it's, it's very different. I, I wish that we could get rid of, of SARS-CoV-2, but I mean, we have animal reservoirs. We have... 80% of white-tailed deer apparently have animals. Goodness, we, we have billions of people who are infected. We have, we have a situation that, that is not congruent with, with zero COVID. Now, I, I have debated with people who believe in zero COVID, and I'm, I'm trying to find some common ground. So, you know, it boils down to asking, well, maybe by, by zero you mean a few billion people being infected? Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that sounds reasonable, you know, not, not well, having I, I eight think, billion. But, I think but, it comes back down to policy, right? So um, April 2020, we find 2.8% of Santa Clara County uh, is infected. Mm -hmm. shows evidence of previous infection, right? So it's 50 times more cases, infections than cases. We don't, as you said, we didn't have early, the ability to test early was not particularly great. Um, was it too late by then? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean even containers would not work. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think if, if you have 2.5% of the population, you, you're talking about tens of thousands of people. Yeah. out there who are infected. So, um, and, and with very limited testing back then, I mean, you're not capturing the vast majority. So... Well, now, but what if the United States and Europe had great testing and the rest of the world didn't? Which is, which I, I was, was very much in favor of testing. Uh, and uh, I remember that we've had debates in the past. I, I was a testing person because I, I like to have eyes on the virus and where it goes and, uh, and try to capture... Well, I mean, I, uh, I, I like data too, John. <laughs> Well, you, you know, some kind of a professional viciousness in the epidemiologist in me. But, uh, but I, no, I, I defended testing and, and aggressive testing. And I, I think that countries that started with aggressive testing in the beginning, and in, in some of my early interviews, 
in the very, very beginning, um, like, you know, February, March, I, I gave Iceland as a nice example because they, they were doing yeah. very extensive testing. Singapore, you know, same thing. South Korea, they had eyes on the distribution of the epidemic wave in the community. And if you have that, you have one more reason not to have people who you know they're infected to go take care of your grandfather or, or you know, to, to go work on, on a nursing home. Right. Uh, so, so, so I think that there's some reasoning behind that in, the er, in, in that countries that did you, lots of testing in the early days. It depends days, on I think what you use it well. for, right? So we have an enormous amount of testing resources now used to essentially yeah. keep, keep kids home from school if they happen to be next to somebody who tests positive. Yeah. No, I think, I think that testing now has become uh, kind, of a, kind of an other obstacle in a way towards reaching normality. And uh, the, the question is, can we incorporate it in a way that it is not disruptive? I think that that's the big balance. I still believe that, that we need testing to protect, especially high-risk facilities. I, I think it's unacceptable not to have testing in high-risk environments. Uh, again, my bias, I like data, I like big numbers, uh, but, but, but it's different now. It's different. It, I mean, right now we have 75 million people with documented infection in the US and probably you need to multiply that by, I don't know, three or four times, perhaps more uh, for the total number of infections. Many people have been infected two times, some people have been infected three times. I mean, now it's, it's too late. It's too late. Yes. And, and, and people think that, that we can just bring the past to the present. And, and science cannot do that. We, we cannot revert time. I, I don't know, maybe... John, I'm waiting for you relativity. to get a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we need some physics uh, person here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this is the fifth question. So uh, we're almost halfway down, John. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, the, the, the forecasts of, these, of the, the pandemic uh, have driven policy in many ways. We, we have this uh, beautiful model, of these compartment models of, you know, uh, sometimes called SIR models, susceptible, infected, recovered. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. might have other components, might be more complicated. The most famous one um, during the pandemic being Neil Ferguson's Imperial College model. And it's driven uh, policy in a way that is absolutely remarkable to me. I mean, I've worked in health policy for many years. I've never seen these kinds of models, which are, I think, very useful tools, but drive policy so in such a, such a fine-tuned, fine-tuned way. Um, what is your assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of these models, and how they've been applied during the pandemic? I've published several papers on this, I know and you have. That's why uh, I, I think that we we just got grossly misled by models. I love models. I run many models myself. I think my, mine are the worst of all. <laughs> uh, but we just could not communicate to policymakers what models are. I mean, models are models. Goodness. And they need to be tailored ag against reality. They need to be appraised against reality. They need to be corrected against reality. So what we saw was that everyone who was doing mathematical modeling and people who had not done mathematical modeling just as well, were just getting models out there. And the, the most ominous the model, the, the higher the value. Uh, and I, I think we saw that in large scale. We saw it in multiple countries. Our models were more influential than others. And I, I, I think that I don't want to blame anyone uh, because I think that they did everything with the best of intentions and they wanted to help. And they said that the world is facing a major crisis. We want to, to put our skills to the task. But, but I, I think that they created chaos. Um, now, could we have done better? Uh, should we have thrown models out the window? No. I mean, they're, they're valuable, but we how, could have... So how, how should they be used? Like, I, I always have thought of them as something where it allows you to understand trade-offs. Like I, I, I think that, that you need models that, number one, they are transparent. Anyone can look at the data and repeat the analysis. You need models that have some source of responsibility for their reproducibility. Uh, so, for example, there's the, the U.S. Uh, forecast hub and another one in Germany and Poland that modelers, many of them, put their predictions. And then a week later or two weeks later, you see what happened to them. Mm -hmm. 
and anyone can see that you know they were correct or they were not and then you can start ameliorating your or fine-tuning your models um, then you need models that capture multiple dimensions they don't look just at cases they look at other types of impact they look at hard outcomes for COVID-19 but they also look at other outcomes like the ones that we mentioned you know mental health uh, other types of health care that would be dismantled because of whatever response so you need to model multiple dimensions y you need models that are properly calibrated that they use inputs that are fairly accurate or if they're not accurate and you have uncertainty they incorporate uncertainty so infection fatality rate for example you mm -hmm. cannot just throw one number there and say it's 0.9 percent and then you run the calculations and maybe you're six times off you need to allow for the uncertainty that you have in that you need models that uh, can be compared and can be assessed and most of the models could not really be, even be compared they, they were just thrown in vacuum taken up by politicians and public health officials most of them had no clue about what they were buying and and then leading to policy that that uh, then there was the the self-vindication clause that well yeah it didn't happen because we saved you Wh which was like the most misleading part yeah. of all so uh, let's take the imperial college mod models uh, which are by one of the best teams in the world i i think these scientists are amazing so we looked at what they published in nature and we realized that uh, they had another model that they had fit to u.s data they had published a nature model based on European countries' data. But at the same time, they generate a second model for the U.S. And the model that they use in the U.S. had a much better fit to the European data as well. So we, we run that other model that was their model on the European data, and we saw that the conclusion was entirely different, entirely opposite. You know, the, the nature publication said that it was lockdown, the draconian version that saved so many millions of lives, the best model by Imperial showed that it had no impact practically in almost any country, with maybe a couple of exceptions. In all countries, it was less draconian measures, more targeted mm. measures, like not having these big events, for example, which yeah. I think made perfect well, sense. Can, uh, the Imperial College model predicted you know, tens of thousands of deaths in Sweden without, in the absence of a lockdown. There, was, there were these like mass gathering restrictions, I think, in Sweden, but they didn't lock down. They didn't have mandatory stay-at-home orders. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't have tens of thousands of deaths, right? So it seems like a indeed, falsification. Indeed, indeed. Well, but, but, but this is really not going anywhere unless you have pre-specification and time-stamped that here's what I predict and let's check two weeks, three weeks, four months, whatever you want down the road. And if you really want to go for much depth in time, you really need to have all the counterfactuals of what might happen that may affect your predictions and make some assessments i mean here's what That's i think will happen but yeah. but if you do this then i expect to see this now then we may start talking if we don't do that it's it's just John, co I think completely I, I, uh, open I, I to agree with that but i think the most important thing you said is broaden the scope of the models you cannot fixate on a single number how many cases are going to be or even how many deaths are going to be from this one cause if you're going to talk about society-wide interventions that are going to have so many multi-dimensional effects, the modeling if to be responsible has to look at all of those, not just simply one of those dimensions of those effects. I, I, I agree. And, and we have given far less thought to all the other dimensions compared to COVID-19. Yeah. And, uh, and unless we do that, any inference is, is interesting as scientific curiosity, but I would not use it for policy decisions. Because right, the mind fixates on the precise looking number. And, and I, I think that it gives an alibi for politicians and for policymakers to say that, well, my modelers say this. But to be honest, I think that someone with common sense would have done better than looking at very fancy models. It, it's, it's sad because, as I say, <laughs> that's the work that I do as well. So, so I count myself as a failure yes. <laughs> in that regard. I mean, they're, they're pretty, but uh, I think they've, they've had a malign effect in this pandemic. Sad. So, okay. Okay. Uh, I'm now, let's change topic. This is now six. Uh, so uh, you've written on, on uh, uh, with large meta-analyses of, of hydroxychloroquine and other, other drugs, other dr drugs that have been proposed as ways to, uh, to treat and manage cases of COVID. 
Um, and they've been enormously controversial. These, especially the cheap drugs, have been enormously controversial. Same time, there have been a lot of drugs that have been approved with seemingly very little regulatory oversight, like a, a drug like remdesivir, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, or, or actually, and dare I say this, even the even the the vaccines for use in children, for instance, with, with I, I would say very minimal evidentiary basis to making these decisions. The regulatory bodies have, have approved a lot of these sort of on patent kind of medications and vaccines very easily, and yet the, the, uh, the, the, the availability of cheap, especially so it's important because it's not just a, 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 a disease of rich countries, but poor countries. The availability of cheap drugs in widespread use is very important if they, they could be available, could save many lives. Um, but there's been this sort of, uh, uh, it, it's, it's almost felt like a, 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 a pressure to not approve those kinds of treatments, whereas fast-tracked approval of many, many more expensive treatments or, or, or vaccines. This no. is a huge conundrum, and uh, it, it, it goes back as a problem way before the COVID-19 pandemic. So m my core interest has always been evidence-based medicine, which means appraising the strengths and the weaknesses of the evidence. And what is like the most important frontier is medications and interventions in medicine. How, how do you regulate this? How do you say that we know that something works or something does not work? Basically, I am pretty conservative. Uh, so, so my bias to start with is that I want to see evidence before I start treating people. Right. Uh, and, well, so uh, like, like you did a study of hydroxychloroquine, the, the literature on it, yeah. it's fine negative. So, so, negative, uh, so right? hydroxychloroquine, we, we did an international meta-analysis. We tried to unearth every single randomized trial that had been done. We had all these investigators join forces with us. They sent us their, their data. We, we could look at what we had available. And I'm really sorry, but hydroxychloroquine, Doesn't if work. anything, increased the risk of death. Hmm. Uh, one might argue that most of these studies were with high risk uh, people at high dose. Uh, but if I had to pinpoint what is my best estimate, is that hydroxychloroquine, at least in high dose, in high risk people, in late stage disease, probably killed people. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many. Maybe it killed 100,000 people. Uh, but but I, I think it was not a good idea. Remdesivir, uh, multiple randomized trials, very early kind of authorization to make the drug available under lots of pressure. We have nothing to give. You know, same thing happened with, with hydroxychloroquine as well. I'm sorry to say, the, the evidence does not really suggest that remdesivir saves lives. Can I exclude uh, a relative risk of 0 0.99? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but based on the randomized trials that I have seen, it doesn't seem to save lives. Does it change a little bit your chances of uh, getting out of the hospital a bit earlier? This is what we saw in the early studies. They have been cited thousands of times. If I had to bet, no. <laughs> I'm really sorry again. Uh, so so, so uh, why is it still in the guidelines? Well, not all guidelines. You know, WHO has a conditional uh, not use type of recommendation. Most European guidelines are not in favor of remdesivir. Um, NIH has a strong recommendation for remdesivir, but the remdesivir trial doesn't, initial doesn't one jump, yeah, came no, from no. NIH. Yes. So, so I'm not sure that it, it's like, you know, I, I come up with something and I say, you need to use it, Jay, from now on. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's interesting. Um, we can, maybe we can talk about some of the other medications, but before that, I wanted to, say, to address an economics point. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a drug company that has a drug that's on patent. It's, it hasn't worked in other settings, but they would love to find a use for it. Uh, they have a very strong interest in running a trial with an endpoint that they can pick mm -hmm. uh, and, and have it be used. And they, they could put poor resources into it. On the other hand, you have cheap drugs that are off patent with nobody owning it, with nobody with a financial interest in running these trials. In principle, you would expect an entity like the NIH, a public entity, to invest in those cheap drugs because there isn't that they're solving a market failure problem by doing that. Yeah. They're doing yeah. an assessment. And yet I, my view is that the NIH has not particularly put a, t a lot of energy into the evaluation of these cheap drugs. Like there's an active six trial that's due to be done, run by the NIH on ivermectin, due to be done in March 2023. Yeah. I, I'm all in favor of 
rigorous randomized trials. Uh, so I, I know that many people have killed each other over ivermectin or, or other, other drugs. Yeah, but we're uh, in the middle of a pandemic. We have to do, we have to make do with based we, on the We, the, we the have to make do, but, 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 but honestly, we can get rapid, reliable answers of that sort. I, I think one of the, of the great successes, for example, was the fact that we had large randomized trials like recovery and solidarity. They gave us answers within months. Right. With many thousands of people randomized with hard outcomes, with mortality outcomes. And, and we could see that, you know, treatment A, B, C, D did not work. And we had some success stories. We had, for example, steroids. Dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Right, yeah. You know, they, they work. They re reduce mortality. Uh, tocilizumab has a pretty solid mortality signal. Not as big, but, but it is there. You know, monoclonal antibodies, they also had a positive uh, yeah, outcome probably. for mortality. I mean, the question is whether they would be still be useful with different variants, but, but that's a different question. And I think we should have done the same for other interventions, either existing ones that were to be repurposed or interventions that are new ones and that some company wants to make uh, big bucks out of it. Yes. <laughs> so, so uh, I have nothing against companies who want to be rich. Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't, again, I, I'm I don't work I'm okay with, with, with companies. <laughs> I, I, again, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, I, I'm there just to be a critical eye on the data and the evidence. But if someone can show me the evidence, I will be out there saying, use this drug. Yes. <laughs> If, if they cannot show me the evidence, uh, it, it will be like a Twitter war. So, so how, do you, how do you assess how well the NIH and the FDA have done in the United States? Poor NIH and poor FDA. Let's please support them, okay? Uh, but support I, I, might I'm, also I'm, I'm involve not, criticism, I'm not right? happy with many things that happened, okay? But, but I, I just, I feel uneasy, especially in this kind of critical situation where, where everyone is blaming uh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> to, to start blaming, you know, NIH and FDA and, and well, CDC. Well, you used to work at NIH. So. Uh, goodness, yes, conflict. Uh, you know, <laughs> Tommy Fauci was, was my director. I love him. I mean, uh, so, you know, FDA have lots of good friends. CDC, I have wonderful friends there. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I've but, actually but, worked with the FDA myself. So but I mean, I, but I, why am I saying this? Uh, lots of people are blaming others. And I think that tons of mistakes happen. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a question for me. It's not a question of, of a personal mistake by the FDA or the NIH. The, the, the question is of one of policy. Like yeah. the, I, I view the FDA as having a role, a very important role, in playing and evaluating the evidence on drugs and deciding whether it's sufficient based on yeah. the evidence to, to, to permit it. And it, it's the role of the NIH to, to pr promote and conduct studies. So let, let, let me give you my personal opinion, which is very biased. So FDA, I think, are heroes, but they're completely outnumbered, okay? They, they have very few staff, and they're bombarded by the industry who is trying to pass everything that they can <laughs> through the doors. And their funding, some of the funding of FDA, FDA indirectly depends on the industry. I don't right. know if, if you're aware of this, that, yeah. but, but the arrangement is such that uh, is in, in, in the depth of your mind, if you work at FDA, you don't want the industry to, to fail. Uh, do I want the industry to fail? No. You know, why, why should they? No, you want, but, you want if, if they have a good drug, you want it yeah. to, to, to succeed, so, right? so, so I think we all agree on this. So FDA is completely outnumbered. They're, they're trying to work under very difficult circumstances against the odds in a high-pressure environment where everybody is putting a knife on their throat People are dying. I mean, I had heard that story with oncology way before the COVID pandemic. Mm. People are dying of cancer. Of course, they die every year. You know, millions die of cancer. But this doesn't mean that we should give them the wrong drug to make them die faster or, or have billions of dollars spent on something that is not going to make them not die. Yeah. So, so in, in COVID-19, what we saw in oncology happening over 30 years was compressed within three months. You know, the, the, the same pressure of 30 years megatones <laughs> compressed into three months. Approve, approve, approve. License, <laughs> license, license. Press the button, please. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, I mean, why should I blame my friends at FDA? If, no, if, I, I also work with the FDA, John. So yeah. I, I, and I, I think there's some excellent scientists and I completely agree with you about the pressure. Yeah. Um, it, but, it's, but it's been heartbreaking to see some of the standards that I think the FDA generally has. So it's people like me and, and you 
when people are under pressure at FDA to tell to all these people who attack FDA, come attack me, you know, <laughs> let these people alone. Oh, to, John, to, I'm to tired of attacks. <laughs> 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 so, so, and and you know, the same applies to to NIH to a large extent. I think that they they did their their best to handle a crisis that they had not met before, and they were not really prepared for that. You know, NIH increasingly became more and more distanced from epidemiology, clinical research, evidence-based medicine. Uh, it, you know, someone needs to support lab research. I have very high opinion about this type of wet lab research and I'm, I'm very supportive of it and I think that more money should go into research in general but you know NIH unfortunately was very weak on this type of disciplines that were badly needed in a pandemic because mm. of course you need basic science of, of the wet lab type but you need basic science of all other sorts and for me evidence-based medicine is a basic science right. and, and NIH just didn't have that and, and CDC had personal cuts over many years and funding cuts and, and again they were not prepared and again they failed to develop, for example, testing. Uh, that was a complete failure. I, I, I recall your early efforts to try to, to mobilize them to, to do the job that they should do and, and then, you know, we tried to fill in the gap and we, we, we got all the rotten tomatoes for, yeah. for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, so that's halfway. Um, actually, th we still have four more to go. Do you want to take a quick break? I think I'm fine. Oh, you're fine? All right, let's keep going. No, no, I'm, I'm actually good. <laughs> okay, so I'm going I'm to turn from, um, from, from this, and actually it's related to this, uh, what we just talked about. So you wrote a piece in Tablet lamenting the smearing and slandering of scientists who have worked during the epidemic. And you just mentioned Rotten Tomatoes, right? Those were actually yeah. very difficult times, like April 2020, May of 2020. It really did feel like we were being pelted with tomatoes for trying to understand the extent of the epidemic. Um, what What are your thoughts about about? For, actually, I'd love to start with maybe your personal experience with that. Um, I mean, if you want, if you care to share about it, and then and then broader thoughts about how how can we do better? Because I think that the kind of environment I think you're going to describe is not an environment where. Uh, where open scientific discourse can happen, where people can honestly disagree with each other in good faith and learn from each other. That, that's a major problem and it, it, is, uh, it, it is a traumatic experience, both for myself and for others. I mean, now I can probably laugh about it and talk about Rotten Tomatoes, but when it was happening, it, it was not laughable. It, it was, you know, getting death threats and, and getting that, that sort of smearing and that sort of animosity and not knowing if someone will walk into your house and execute you along with your family. Uh, it was not just me, it was also my, fa my family. You know, my, my mother uh, almost died from a social media hoax. You know, they, they circulated that she had died of coronavirus and people started calling her uh, to, to ask her when is her funeral. <laughs> and she went into a hypertensive crisis, she almost died. So I, I, I feel very sorry for all of these people who did this. I feel very sorry for them because it's, it's very unfortunate. And I, I feel more sorry for all the attacks that were launched against people who had different opinions compared to mine. So if, if anything, I would like to protect those who disagreed with me more than the people who agreed with me. Because for a scientist and for any human being, there's no way that you can function. There's no way that you can feel a free person, a balanced person, if you're under such tremendous stress and, you know, just not being certain about what, what is coming next. It sounds crazy, but, but once you go down that crazy path, anything can happen. So I... I could say, like, the same, the similar thing happened to me during, the, uh, during those, those uh, early months of the pandemic. Uh, I, 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 uh, I had a, a reporter who wrote a story about my wife. Now, she's a civilian in this. Yeah. She's not, and she's, you know, she's trying to do her best, and they, they, but they put her in, in the national spotlight in a negative way. I felt like I couldn't protect my family. I also had the death threats, some, some, some racist attacks. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I probably, this is probably good for my health, so I should probably thank them, but I lost 30 pounds just from the anxiety around that in a, in a, in a one month period. Um, it's, it's, it's just a horrible experience. And, I'm, I'm trying to, f to forget as much as possible. It's not possible to forget because this is still happening. I, I, mean, I think, you know, if you just go to Wikipedia, this is being vandalized or attacked or censored or you have 
crazy things added about me or you or, or others, uh, it's, it's still happening to, to a large extent. And I, I think that the only re reply to that is, can we seek dignity? Can we seek some sort of reconciliation? And what I say is, is it is very sad that this thing happened to me, but I don't want to see that happen to people who disagree with me. Mm. And I, I think that I have seen many scientists on all sides of the story being attacked mm. from different parts of the dissenters or, or <laughs> you know, clans that are formed, especially around social media much of the time. Um, you had a, a horrible experience with uh, the Great Barrington Declaration versus the John Snow there, Memorandum. It was, a, it was organized, right? So Francis Goodness. Collins uh, called me a fringe. Actually, I've, I've, I've now I, I'm thinking of putting that on my, on my uh, business card, fringe epidemiologist, and jo asking people to join the club. So, goodness, I, uh, I, I did not sign the Great Barrington Declaration, and I did not sign the Well, John you don't Snow like Memorandum. to sign anything, John. So uh, and, and, and the reason for that is that even before the pandemic, I had published a paper where I explained that I do not believe in signature collection for settling scientific debates. I, b I believe that... So, so, John, can I make a defense? Yeah, please. Um, uh, so, so <laughs> I have never signed a petition before, my, before the Great Grand Declaration, never authored a petition. It was the first time in my life. And I think I, I probably have one declaration in me in my entire life. Uh, so I'm, I'm, and I, but I'm still immensely proud of it. Um, one of the goals of it, one of my goals in signing it, was to make clear that there was not actually a scientific consensus in favor of lockdown. Yeah. And that, I think, we succeeded. Right, tens of thousands of scientists did sign. They I think have the, like I think, a, a million signatures. Yeah, almost yeah. a million signatures for regular people. Tens of thousands of scientists, doctors, and so on. Um, the the uh, the. It seemed to me at the time, and still seems to me, that there there really wasn't any other mechanism to make clear that there wasn't a consensus. Yeah, I, Jay, can I congratulate you for the Great Barrington Declaration, and at the same time congratulate the people who created the John Snow Memorandum for what they no, did. Well, it's clear for, right? for, for the sense of social responsibility that you had. I mean, th this is the way that I want to see it, that you and others decided that, goodness, something very serious is happening here. We have a major crisis. We need to offer our best. And this is what we think is the best. And people on the other side of the John Snow Memorandum, they did the same. And I have to say, I, I, I know many people on both lists the amazing scientists on both lists, good friends on both lists. And as I said, I didn't sign anything, I, I, either these or others, because, the thing, because actually, of, of, let me, of my let me stance. Let me agree with you, John. But, but, let me agree with you. Because I yeah. think um, both the Great Branton Declaration and the John Snow Memorandum, although there's lots I disagree with about John Snow, it was not an ad hominem smear. It was a set yes. of arguments put forward by, the, by, pe by people who have good, in good faith saying we should follow such and such a policy. And the same thing, I think, with the Great Barrington, I mean, I, I know with the Great Barrington Declaration. Yeah, um, yeah. Th that kind of engagement is actually good. Whereas the, the smearing, the death threats... So the... this is what we need to dissociate. One is your intellectual and social understanding of the problem. And I think you're entitled to do this. And I think that people who are on the Jon Snow Memorandum are also entitled to do this. And to be honest, when I look at these documents, even though they're portrayed as being like uh, light years apart, I think about 60% people would agree. I mean, mm. there are differences. There's clear differences. But, but there's a lot of things that are common. I, I see people like Mark Lipsitz, you know, an amazing uh, person in, in this field. Many of his papers that I read, I mean, they, they sound a little bit like a great, great, great Barrington right, Declaration. <laughs> you know, he could have signed that, I believe. Well, I had a debate with him in, um, in November of 2020, uh, organized by Howard Bachner at JAMA. And it, mm -hmm. it was actually, it was more, I, I was surprised, at least I personally, I don't know if Mark would agree, but I found a lot of, of places where we, we agreed, like schools, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So, so and, and maybe your agreement might have grown bigger over time. And it, it would be nice to have that conversation. And, and it could be private, it could be public uh, again. And um, maybe the, the, uh, the acceptance and agreement rate is much higher now. I, I had a discussion with Mark the very same day I published my stat piece in 2020. And on the phone, I think we agreed on 98%. On what he wrote, it seemed like we disagreed a lot. But when we discussed it, I thought that we had agreed. I don't know what happened then. <laughs> uh, but but any, at any rate, what you described was an orchestrated attack, you know, to kind of take you down. And it's very unfortunate that, that Francis Collins... Uh, in the conversation with Tony Fauci used that, that word. And I, I, I really feel very sad about it because 
I, I have the highest well, opinion admire possible I admire for, for, for Francis and for Tony. Yeah. I mean, I, I, they're my heroes. I, I believe they're amazing scientists. You know, I, I, have, I have been in committees where I was one of the people who said that we should give awards to, to Francis and, and to Tony, and it did happen. So, and I, I would do it again you know, <laughs> if, 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 uh, I if occasions I arose. I, I, I think that they're Nobel Prize level scientists, but that was entirely, entirely inappropriate. So I'm, I'm trying to, to think, goodness, what happened here? What happened to Francis? What happened to Tony? And my explanation, but I may be wrong. They said that, that you and the others in the Great Bank of the Creation are, are fringe epidemiologists. Okay, so, so I, I did a very quick exercise. I went to the National Library of Medicine, PubMed, and I put the names of five top journals that I believe are top epidemiology journals and also have epidemiology in their name. So... Epidemiology, International Journal of Epidemiology, American Journal of Epidemiology, European Journal of Epidemiology, Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, and then uh, Fauci, uh, A, and then uh, Collins. Collins, F. Uh, how many uh, papers have they published in these journals? I don't think very many is my take. Uh, Tony has published zero, and Francis has published one. Uh, and that one is with, with Terry Manolio, he's one of the senior authors. Uh, Terry's a wonderful epidemiologist, and I think you know, he, the, the director of NIH had to be on board for that. So, so basically, Tony and Francis were making a statement about a, a field that have no clue about. They have no clue about epidemiology. They're, they're top in genetics and top in infectious diseases and immunology, but they have no clue about epidemiology. And so I'm trying to think, so they must have had some epidemiologist. <laughs> About uh, you know Martin Kuldorf and uh, Sunetra Gupta and uh, who is that guy Jay Bhattacharya, <laughs> and maybe that epidemiologist uh, told them oh no 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 these people I want to to well, John, kill everyone. A, there was a very interesting email that uh, and there was a <laughs> Buzzfeed of all places had a, a Freedom of Information Act request for Tony Fauci's emails, and there was an email that mentioned you John actually okay. uh, in the context of the Santa Clara study. And? It was five pages <laughs> of redacted text from, written by Tony Fauci, I think. A, a huge number of pages. At the very bottom, it said, well, we don't know any of the author's study except John Ioannidis. Um, okay. Someone should reach out That's to him. That's not bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was at least one non-fringe epidemiologist I, involved. I, I hope he has something good to say did he, about But me. he didn't reach but out I, to you, I, did I only have good things to say yeah, about him. So. Uh, but but, but it's, it's sad because then, then you start depending on people who you have to trust that they know what they're talking about. And I really don't know who were the people that Tony and, and Francis asked and whether they were epidemiologists or whether they were some social media people. I mean, it, it seems like they, they asked people to write stories in, in media about you. I mean, that's not science. Wait a second. I mean... I, I, I just, well, I I just think, know, I don't know John, what um, happened here. There, there we, have a, we have a case where there's a black and white email that suggests that there was such a campaign. But John, I believe there was probably a campaign. I mean, you've had many, many media stories written about you. Yeah. And how does that occur? Like, how does it occur that you become the focus of these mm. sort of... I'm a bad hit person, pieces, Jay. Don't you know that? <laughs> Uh, and how does science occur? A nasty occur? person. I mean, it needs to be destroyed. I, well, I just, I mean, in all seriousness, John, how does how does science how does like science requires good faith conversations between people who disagree with each other, um, tempered by data, right? So we we are looking at the same data. We may have different conclusions about it, but that it but we're but I'm when we disagree, we disagree in good faith. So I hope to learn from you, and maybe you hope to learn from me. So evidence evidence based medicine says that if you smear someone. Even if this is fake, the effect stays. So the, the, the credibility of that person and the ability of that person to make an impact, to, to have their work recognized, is destroyed. So even if it's completely fake, even if it is corrected at some point, it's very sad. It's very sad that, that, that we have reached that point in science. And, and as I say... Uh, if you have more smearing, don't smear my opponent. Smear me, <laughs> please, <laughs> because I, I hate to see that. I mean, I, I, I think I can take it better <laughs> when people smear me rather than smear my opponents. Okay, so question eight. Uh, what is the pandemic revealed about the strengths and weaknesses of science and how science is used in society and, po and in and policy making? The pandemic has been a great opportunity for science. 
I, I have written about it uh, several times and as I say, I, I, I have always felt that science is not something that people are interested in. That you, you, you wished to have more people interested in science before the pandemic. I, I felt so lonely trying to talk about the scientific method. I had wonderful students taking my courses, but, but then going to the community and talking about reproducibility and methods and statistics and uh, models and uh, uh, data sharing and uh, research practices. Uh, goodness, who would care about that? Well, you had a broader audience than you probably realized, John. Uh, well, I, m maybe, maybe, but, but, but I, I, I want I want to be a realist. I mean, I, I would not be able to compete against a rock star, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so suddenly, uh, you have the COVID-19 pandemic, and everybody is interested in science. Everybody becomes a scientist overnight. They debate about science, they write about science in, in media, in social media, no matter what their background is, no matter what their training is. Now, is, is that bad? No, it's a great opportunity. Um, because now we can teach people how science works. And how does science work? Well, it works by being open, transparent, sharing, universal, not conflicted, using rigorous methods, trying to reproduce them, and encompassing uncertainty. These are the main <laughs> lessons. Uh, which one did we pass? <laughs> I, I, I think we, we failed. We failed. And I, I, I again, well, we did, I blame myself we for, did, for we the failure. We did produce the vaccine. Yes. Major success. Major success. So, so the, the prototype We, not of, meaning me, we, we, we in the Not process. us. No, we, we, we are the bad people. Yeah, okay? no, the, the, the good people <laughs> in science produce the vaccine. And, well, I tried to do my best to promote uh, using vaccines. Uh, even so, more so, so in, high, right? in, in high impact uh, uh, high-risk populations, and I, th I think it's, it's crazy, you know, not, not to, to vaccinate. But in a way, that sense that science is about moonshots and uh, delivering miracle cures, that's the wrong lesson about science. Because, because science is about a series of failures that eventually leads to something successful after some time and after lots of efforts and after lots of failing people like me, <laughs> you know, get to have someone like you or someone else oh, no, come to, on, to, to do something. No, I, th well, I, th I, think, I think there's a lot to that, right? The, the idea is of science is we are all groping in the dark. Yes. And you find something and it's not everything, but it's something. And then I, because you've found this, can find another thing. And we, and we, are, we're, we may disagree about what you found, but that disagreement leads to, you know, a data... Uh, an experiment that helps us resolve that. Yeah. It's, it's in good. The, the way in, that I describe it is is like swimming in an ocean at night. Okay, and and I like swimming. I, I grew up in Greece, so I love swimming. I love swimming even at night. So so I really enjoy this. Uh, now there's sharks floating around, <laughs> and there's big waves, and there's other dangers, jellyfish or or whatever. The jellyfish are very annoying, I have to say. You know, Twitter sounds like jellyfish. But, uh, but I, I think that, that this is the message that we should have given about science, that scientists are basically well-intentioned people working very hard, making lots of mistakes, but eventually getting something right. And look at that. Now we also have a vaccine, multiple vaccines, which is wonderful news. It's an iterative process. It's not an authoritarian process. It's not something that someone imposes. It's not something that someone mandates. It is something that is shared as a gift to the community, as an enlightenment, as knowledge, as benefit, as good, for the greater good. Hmm? Makes me want to be a scientist, John, the way you describe it. Um, but that's not what we sold. Yeah. And, and what I worry is that we sold the prototype of science as being miracle cures uh, of all sorts, like these drugs that everyone believed that they're effective from day one, even though we had no evidence. Uh, we sold science as uh, Big Pharma is good for you. Kudos to all the companies that produce vaccines. But, but goodness, I mean, this creates like a mentality that if you say anything about their studies, you, you are... A bad guy. A bad guy, you know, well, to, to well, be tortured. Uh, but like, and how about science as a, as, as a uh, sufficient reason for policymaking? 
right? So follow the science. Does that does? I mean, I think I found that incredibly annoying, right? So science is a is a contributor to help understand the parameters of policy making, but it is not by itself a sufficient argument for a, one policy over the other. Science, in, in that sense, is um, uh, has no particular implication in terms of you must do pol you must do yeah. X. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's a it's 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 more of a conditional thing. If you do X, you'll get Y. If you do Z, you'll get A. And do I want A or do I want uh, you know that Y? Science is... provides information, provides evidence. Uh, it it changes the entropy of what we we know or we do not know. And then decisions need to be made. The, the decisions need to take into account multiple aspects of science, of preferences, of shared decision making. Uh, we see that at the level of individual patients. We have the evidence, which usually has a lot of uncertainty, and then we have the individual patient who has his or her own preferences about what to do with their lives. And we just need to be able to communicate to that person as clearly as possible what we don't know, what we know, of course, what we don't know, how much uncertainty there is, what are the options, what are the pros and cons. And then that person? And that person decides. Yeah. So now we don't have a single person. We have, like, the entire world, uh, an entire country, an entire county, you know, thousands, millions, billions of people who we try to affect with science. We need to have the same shared decision making. We need to be able to take multiple dimensions, multiple preferences, multiple aspects of what life is, what we value about life, what, what makes sense for us, why are we still alive and not you know, going to commit suicide. So, so all of that disappeared overnight. It just became, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. It's, it's a little bit like... Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the, these uh, minions, uh, uh, Domiletto, 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 <laughs> okay, I mean, you know, I, I know how to do it, I know how to do it, and, and everybody jumping to do it the way that they knew how to do it, and, and that has nothing to do with science, yeah. it's, it's uh, Despicable Me, I mean, that's, uh, that's what it is, and I love Despicable Me, don't get me wrong. <laughs> okay, question nine. Um, and this follows on directly, what reforms are needed to restore science? And then how hopeful are you about the future of science? Reforms are happening, have happened, will happen. Science is a living experience. It's a, it's a living endeavor. It is not something that I should decide or anyone should decide. It's 35 million people who have co-authored scientific papers, if you look at, at databases of, of bibliometrics. And each one of us is making some contribution. Some of what we contribute may be positive, some other things may be negative. We try to aim for more positive. I, I think that there's a lot of discussion, and this has been going on for many years now, that we recognize that there are strategic areas that we need to improve. We need to improve on all these dimensions that I mentioned before, how we do our research, how we communicate, how we improve our methods, how we share more how we are more transparent, how we pay more attention to balances of benefits and harms, uh, how we uh, use the best analytical tools, the best models, the best statistics. So th there's, there's plenty of things to try to do things better. And I don't want to be a pessimist. I want to think that scientists want to make things better. And I believe that society should also want science to be improved because it has become obvious that science can be an amazing tool, an amazing, powerful tool, but also it can create all these ripples of problems if it is misused. So I think the willingness is there. There's also obstacles. There's uh, obstacles that go against transparency and more towards stealth, not share the data, not make something visible because we don't want to get into trouble. There's uh, tendencies of uh, conflicts becoming more prominent. I think is, that is, is there a problem of, of cartels? I mean, it seems to me from the outs, uh, that a lot of uh, that, that it's a relatively small number of, of scientists. I don't know the, the number, maybe a hundred, two hundred, a thousand, um, that have controlled much of the discourse. Um, and it, it, during the pandemic, in terms of what 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 does science say? Mm -hmm. Is that healthy? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know whether I can put an exact number to that. If, if we stick to COVID-19, we saw a huge number of scientists publishing on COVID-19. You know, probably over a million scientists co-authored something. But as you say, 
there's probably a much, much smaller group that were very influential in shaping the discussion and in shaping also policy. And in, in many cases, actually, that group was detached from the real scientific literature. I mean, we, we've uh, done some analysis, for example, looking at experts who are very visible in media in the US, in Switzerland, Greece, and Denmark. And a large share of them had never published anything on COVID-19. You know, they, they were in the news all the time <laughs> talking about what we know and what we should do. And here it is, the wave is coming. And uh, you know, you know, I don't know how much of that was vindicated, but they, they had no scientific background on what they were talking about. Mm. There were many others that had very strong scientific background in, in this. And, and of course, there's others who may have published nothing and maybe had other types of experience. Maybe they were frontline physicians, for example. And so, that, you know, of course, you want to know this type of opinion. You, sure. You, I mean, if, you, if you've treated 500 people, you published no papers. Them. I prefer someone who's yeah. treated 500 people rather than someone who's published a paper. Uh, but I think that there has been imbalance of allocation of attention. There has been imbalance of uh, running authoritarian themes through science and its interpretation. And, and actually, it's been, it's been, um, that's been leveraged with this, uh, this almost remarkable sort of censorship of alternate views, right? So big tech yeah. will, I mean, you've, uh, you've had YouTube videos. Yeah, I had a YouTube uh, removed. I've, had, I've also had, a, I, think, I think you basically, in order to be a, uh, to, to, to be a, 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 a influential scientist, you, you must, you should have a YouTube video removed at this point, right? I, I think so, honor. yeah. That, that, was a, that was an interview where I said that science is the best thing that has happened to humans. <laughs> so, so this had to be suppressed. I mean, science is the best thing that has happened to humans. No way, get rid of this. Uh, no, I'm, I'm joking, but, but it's sad. I mean, you know, uh, high tech is high tech. I, I admire what they do. I mean, they have improved our lives, my laptop, my Zoom meetings, I can uh, stay protected while others are dying uh, based on uh, what they have offered me. But uh, goodness, they should not be arbitrators of science. If they want to contribute to science, they can do it. They can you know, put together their uh, research or knowledge or whatever and share it. Actually, I think that it would be a big bonus if much of that high tech and stealth unicorn type of uh, startups could share more of what we do. they do. I mean, this is really my main concern that I had when I jumped above the parapet to say that Theranos <laughs> is, is not worth it. And I was the first one and got lots of rotten tomatoes at that time. While well, you've been vindicated uh, well. on that, I think pretty... pretty Goodness, simple, yeah, yeah but, but it took a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think we should have more of high tech contributing to science as research and as research products, not as some high-level authoritarian censor mechanism because they, they're not entitled to do that. They, they have no way that they can understand what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, they may have some consultants, you know, some scientists who allow themselves to be censors of the censors. But that's the funny thing there is like if they're fellow scientists, that what they should seek to do is to critique, to referee, to, to like discuss, yeah. bring, bring into discussion, not to suppress. Um, I, I think... I, I think I'm not saying that we should not have scientists in these roles. I, th I yeah. think actually we should have scientists in these roles. But having scientists in these roles means that you try to allow for the multiple dimensions of arguments. And of course, share the best evidence. And if people can see the best evidence, I think knowledgeable people and people with common sense, they will be able to, to say, yes, this is more but, likely okay, John, to be Okay, John, so let me, let me play the devil's advocate. As you said, scientists are always wrong. That's just well, by nature. Very often. Very but, often. But, but eventually but, but, we but correct the public, our errors. The public then sees sometimes the not the best evidence. And the, uh, is, the is that dangerous? Sees, the public sees a conglomerate of chaos. Yeah. This is what the public sees. And, and all of that is wrapped into some presentation that this is science. This is, this is, is holy science. Is, is this dangerous during a pandemic to show the public that messy science? No, we should. Now, we, we should come out there and say, I'm Johnny Anidis, I'm an idiot, <laughs> but I'm working hard to correct my mistakes. You know, this is why I'm a scientist. If, if, I, if I knew the truth and, and I had perfect knowledge, I, I would probably, you know, be a priest and a preacher. Well, you'd and, be God. <laughs> uh, Some people think well, you are, John, I'm just so you don't, I don't know if you know. Oh goodness! Uh, no, no. Uh, these uh, a Greek god. The, the death threats uh, <laughs> can kill me. <laughs> Don't tell me that. 
I mean, so are, are you hopeful? I want to be hopeful. I want to be hopeful. I, I think that, that humanity should have a future. I think that science should have a future. We have such brilliant people. We have young people with, with amazing ideas. I mean, every, every time I, I teach something, I feel that I'm taught by my students. They can show me how wrong I am. I mean, this is why I continue doing this. Not because I have something to teach others, but because I'm there to be able to find out again John, you were wrong again, and oh goodness, this is a isn't it great when a idea. student tells you that you're wrong uh, and that they're they're right? It's, a, it's the, the most reassuring thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John. So question ten. Uh, this is this is a real treat for me, and I because I, I, I'm sh pretty sure most of the audience that's listening does not know this about you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so so from what I understand, John, you have written operas, and you teach a class on poetry. Okay. <laughs> Is that true? Uh, tell, please tell yes. us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And where can, they, where, can, where can folks in the audience find your work? Okay, so uh, I write literature. I have published eight books uh, in Greek. Uh, three of them were finalists for the Best Book of uh, the Year Award, the Anagnos Award in, in uh, Greece. Uh, one of them in the English version will be published very soon. So I don't know if it's I'm a matter of, to reading it, of John. days or, or, or weeks. Uh, but uh, yeah, I look forward to... Uh, giving more opportunities to people to say that uh, John is a lost cause. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I really enjoy that. I, I, I enjoy writing and uh, I, I write in very mixed modes uh, that might include poetry, prose, novel, theater, uh, libretti for operas <laughs> as well, sometimes intermingled to try to create some... Uh, some whole of, of, of a work. So, so when uh, this book is published in English, I think that uh, you will tell me, uh, John, I lost uh, <laughs> every idea about it. <laughs> so you. actually, I'd, lo I'd love to know, and because I don't actually know the answer, how did you get interested? Is this something, did you, did you always want to be a scientist and this, this is all sort of attracted you, this, this sort of like literary uh, interest, or is this where it's competed for your attention the entire so, time? So it, it has competed for my attention since I, I remember myself. I, I finished my first book when I was uh, eight years old. I bound it myself and I started giving it out to, to family and, uh, and friends. I'm, I'm glad that it was not officially published. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm, sure I'm, 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 I'm writing since I remember myself and I, I really enjoy this. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a back door in communication with science. So, so science is reflected. In that writing, but of course, it's not an introduction, methods, uh, results, uh, discussion type of, of writing. It's a different type of approach to concepts, ideas, emotions, knowledge, and understanding. It's a different language. It's a different language as well, yeah. not just Greek yes, versus exactly. English. It's it's a different language in terms of how you communicate. But there there is a backdoor, and there is communication between the two. And I believe that some of the freedom that you get out of writing. Uh, it's something that is very common with science. You, you need to be able to think freely in order to write, in order to do science. If, if you're subjugated to some dogma or to some Actually, this is way that things need to be said or written, then you cannot write like and then you, you cannot this do is something science. I, I, hope, I hope I'm not revealing too much, but like I remember one thing that you told me in a conversation we had during, it was almost like six months ago, that you, you actually had trouble writing because you felt you didn't feel that freedom that you'd always felt your entire yeah. life. This is true. I mean, for, for several months, I, I could not write uh, outside of science, which I think I polluted the literature with many papers. But uh, I think that you need to have uh, a balance and you need to have some sense that you're free to express yourself. And the environment was not the environment where free people were living. It was an environment of fear, panic, subjugation, uh, narratives that were authoritarian, that you could not challenge. And I think if this happened to me, I, I, I can imagine what happened to other people. You know, I, I consider myself to be very uninhibited in a way. So if, if I could be suppressed, then I don't know what would have happened to other people. And, and the same happens to all arts. I mean, how do you measure the devastation of art during the pandemic? Yeah. I think that many artists probably just, I don't know if they will be able to come back. Yeah, many, you, you mentioned opera. We had one of my operas where I wrote the libretto, the music is by Harris Rondos. It was staged in the, the Greek National Opera. And uh, 
we couldn't have it live. So it was videotaped and it was available for six months online through, <laughs> through your computer. But, but, but this is a very different feeling. It's a very different feeling to have opera as a living thing, as a living art, versus just seeing it on YouTube as you see a movie or as, as you see a, a lecture. We had another opera that uh, we had endorsement from uh, Stanford, from the Dean of Medicine, from the, the Dean of Humanities, to launch it at Stanford. And that was to happen in 2020. And we hope to do it, but still we haven't. And uh, we, we just wait for the world to come back to its normal senses to be able to do it. I mean, I've talked to many artists during the pandemic and they, 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 they describe the experience you had. Like they, 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 that their work, their life's passion was deemed non-essential. And it was a personal assault on them because the things that they valued, the things that the way they connect with other humans was taken away from them. Indeed, indeed. And, and it's, it's very difficult to measure that. I mean, in, in medicine, we measured cases, hospitalizations, deaths, uh, quality of life, adjusted life years. What is the quality of not having art or having this minimal art or, or having art that you, you hear to the musicians playing in Zoom? What is the quality of that? What is the loss that we have as a community, as human beings, as civilization, as culture? I cannot measure that, for, but for, for me, it is immense. I, I was talking with a composer yesterday who's, who's writing a symphonic poem based on my poetry. And he sent me the, the, the first part, and I loved it. And he said, this is how we will launch a revolution. I said, okay, I'm... I'm... You know, I think he's right, John. <laughs> Actually, in, in all seriousness, I think... Um, in times of great suffering, very often art, art, great art comes of it, and healing comes of it. And maybe it's a revolution, but it, it's a it's a it's a it's a revolution that that restores the human spirit rather rather than it is a peaceful it. revolution. Yeah. It is it is a spiritual revolution. It is a revolution that you you don't need to harm anyone, and you just benefit everyone. And isn't this what we want to do in public health? Isn't this what we want to do in medicine? But we also want to do that in other things like art. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we don't give up as humanity. We, we still have some time to go, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, John. That, I, we've now run through my very long list of questions. It was a real pleasure to talk with you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. The pleasure was all yeah. mine.